Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Deborah Henderson, uh, the Chairwoman of Health and Wellness Committee of the Beverly Hills Chamber of Commerce. We're very excited today to bring you a health talk and we hope to do more of these in the future. Certainly now health and wellness is a big concern. Uh, certainly all of us are looking for ideas, tips on wellness and uh, this will focus uh, specifically on men men's health and wellness in regards to aging. So we're excited to welcome Dr. Daniel Perriman and Dr. Nell Smircina, and we are excited to have them present to you a presentation today. Uh, please put questions in the chat. We will be asking those questions at the end of the presentation. So I'll monitor that and uh, go ahead and just add those in the chat as we go along. So we'll answer those at the end. Thank you very much. And we'll turn it over now to the doctors. Yay, thank you, Deb. All right, so uh, welcome everybody in. Thanks, Deb, for the introductions. Um, uh, today we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, men's health and it's, it's November, it's Men's Health Awareness Month. Um, so we just wanted to, Dr. Nell and I, um, you know, give everybody a little bit of a baseline as to, you know, the common things that happen to men as they age and, and really, you know, what can be done to prevent or even reverse some of these, you know, what are considered, considered normal signs of aging. Um, so again, I'm Dr. Perman. Um, I'm a functional neurologist. Basically, I specialize in concussions, migraines, and dizziness disorders. Um, so I do a lot of neurological rehab, um, vestibular rehab, eye motion rehab, um, uh, all sorts of rehabilitation techniques. But um, because of the conditions that I do treat, I focus a lot on hormonal regulation, a lot on nutritional regulation, um, working on our internal environment and our external environment as much as possible is extremely important for managing these kinds of conditions effectively. Um, so that's where I've gotten a little bit deeper into the metabolic side of this, which is, you know, the hormonal regulation and nutrition, which you're going to hear quite a bit about today. Um, I'll, I'll pass it over to Dr. Nell now to tell you a little bit more about her, but I'm super excited and happy to be um, having this talk tag team by Dr. Nell. She is a, a in, incredible practitioner. So it's a it really is an honor to be uh, giving this talk with her today. Thanks, Dr. Dan, for that intro. I feel like that's better than I could do myself. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, so the hormonal and really lifestyle medicine is what really brings Dr. Dan and I together on this, seeing that a lot of these common symptoms that we often write off as, oh, this is normal aging, can really be affected by things we do in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so I'm the founder of Peak Health. I work primarily in men's health um, and I'm a licensed acupuncturist and functional medicine practitioner. So with acupuncture, it's all about nervous system regulation and hormonal regulation and all the things that are really tied together, which you guys are gonna hear a lot about during this presentation. Nick, you wanna go to the next slide? So just to kind of set the stage, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview. What is andropause? Uh, symptoms of suboptimal sub aging, causes of suboptimal aging. And I do want to note the reason we're saying suboptimal is because you can be aging relatively well, but there are always things that we can do to tweak that to make it a little bit better. And we all should feel empowered to do things in our day-to-day -day lives to improve our aging. Um, and it's not enough to talk about symptoms and causes without talking about some solutions. And really wanted to give you all some different ideas and see what resonates with you. And Dr. Dan and I are always here as resources um, for additional questions. And we want this to be very interactive. Um, so even though we're holding questions to the end, please be thinking as we're going through this because this is in no way gonna be a long lecture. Um, we both do a lot of lectures, but this is more to bring value to the people who are here. So what you all need specifically, we'll go through all of this and anything additional we can tackle at the end, we absolutely will. Next, Nick. So like we said, 
Many symptoms often get written off as normal signs of aging. And we're going to break those down. And I think you'll be realizing, oh, wow, that sounds like me, or that sounds like someone I know. Unfortunately, within the standard of care, uh, there's often limited options with that. So men get into their 40s and 50s. The most common complaint I hear in my practice is, I just don't feel like I used to feel, even if there isn't one specific thing that someone can pinpoint. Um, and a lot of times that winds up being a solution of testosterone supplementation, for example, which can give really dramatic results to a symptom, but not necessarily going to ad address the underlying issue of why is testosterone low? What can I be doing other than testosterone supplementation uh, to help myself with my aging and these symptoms? And the exciting part of all this is you can potentially prevent or reverse a lot of these common symptoms. Nick? Next, please. So looking at these common symptoms and purposely put on here, do these sound like you or someone you know? Because I know plenty of people that fit into these categories, but changes in your body, like decreased muscle mass, increased body fat or hair loss, waking up one day and realizing, wait a second, I thought I was doing all of the same things and eating the same things and suddenly I'm holding a little more body fat than I used to. Uh, and my muscles are not as strong or they aren't as defined and I'm not quite sure what happened there. Maybe a little bit more belly fat. And that often gets written off as, oh, that's normal, particularly for men with aging. Um, decreased sex drive and stamina can often be written off at, look, I'm working a lot, not as young as I used to be. Um, maybe I've been married for a long time. Maybe there's kids in the house, things have changed. A lot of these common symptoms with aging are very easy to write off, which is what unfortunately makes them in the standard of care difficult to treat because uh, we just shrug them off as normal. Decreased energy and focus. So I hear a lot from men because I treat a lot of executives and CEOs who are like, I used to work 14 hours a day and I was on it. I was on top of things in meetings, no problem. And now suddenly I hit hour six and it's brain fog. Or, you know, I used to be a morning person, but it, it takes me a while to get engaged. Um, or poor sleep and recovery. And this could be athletic recovery. Suddenly workouts you used to do, you're waking up from and feeling sore every single day. Or you used to recover from a workout in a day and it takes three days now or you're sleeping, but, oh, I just can't get past that four o'clock hour. I'm waking up at four o'clock or suddenly I'm a light sleeper. So this common denominator of, I just don't feel like I used to feel. Nick, next. So we're gonna talk a little bit about root cause of things today, and that helps lead us to solutions rather than just the symptoms, because I think, Anyone who's listening to this or anyone who does not feel like they used to feel can easily identify what the symptoms are. And if it were easy to find a cause, everybody would be doing it and living their best life ever and having tremendous success with anti-aging. So we want to talk about some of those underlying causes of suboptimal aging. So we hear a lot about genetics. Again, that's a really easy thing to write off, right? Like, oh, well, you know, my dad was bald at this age, or, oh, you know, my mom had this skin condition, so that's probably why I have this, or, hey, you know, this person went through this shift at this time in my family. Um, but something I always like to say to my patients, and you may have heard before, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So that does not mean that there's nothing to genetics. It just means that we have a lot of power through our environment and through our lifestyle to affect our genetics and to affect aging in general. Next. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to get into some of the, the more common changes that occur in a man's body. But um, first, I just want to kind of harp on some of the points that Dr. Nell, Nell hit on because they're just so critically important. Um, one being the importance of figuring out really why are you the way that you are? Um, just because, you know, you're low in testosterone doesn't necessarily mean we give you testosterone. You know, that may be a band-aid fix, but that really doesn't figure out, you know, why is your testosterone abnormal? 
Um, so, you know, I, I, I know in my practice, and I'm sure I'm sure in Dr. Nels as well, we like to run tests that try to show us, you know, what is the full picture here? Let's say you're low in testosterone, why? Is it because you're not making enough of it? Is it because you're breaking it down too quickly? So if we can figure out where the breakdown is so that we can give your body the tools that it needs to make the right amount of things at the right time, that's a much better option for us because it's not so targeted because you're gonna learn that, you know, some symptoms of normal aging are due to too much testosterone. Some are due to too little testosterone. So by just modulating the testosterone with you know artificial testosterone doesn't really do what we're trying to, to do with it. Um, on top of that, you know the, the talking about genetics, um, you do not need to be a victim of your genetics. But they're very real. Like our, our genetics are an, an issue and something we need to address. But just because you might have a gene that says you're going to end up with some sort of condition or, or, you know, some sort of body type doesn't mean that you have to be exactly like that. You know, there are things that can be done to reduce the likelihood that you're going to end up like that or make it so that you're not going to end up like that at all. So this is a field called epigenetics. It's, it's kind of a newer, a newer field, um, how we can affect our genetics and not be such a so slave to, to what we've got in our DNA. Um, really, really important stuff. Okay, so that's all going to kind of become a little clearer when we go into these changes here. So body changes with men. What are the most common? Well, the most common are increased fat, um, decreased muscle mass, and then balding. You know, the, those are those are the the more common. You know, losing hair up top, gaining hair in, in all other ways. Let's start with the belly fat. Um, the belly fat that we typically experience as we get older can most of the time be boiled down to inflammation. A lot of the time that belly that we see, it's not all fat. You know, some of it is just inflammation from our diet, from a parasite, from a leaky gut, um, from just not exercising or taking care of herself appropriately. So there's not only fat that we're dealing with there. Sometimes it's your organs that are, tip that are actually inflamed. Um, so there's more to the belly fat than just addressing, you know, the, the fat, the, the exercise component that would help to reduce that belly fat. So it's really critical that as we age, we focus extra on our internal and our external environment. And we can start with the internal environment with, you know, nutrition, putting good food into our body that is not inflammatory. Um, so I'm not going to get this isn't a nutrition lecture, so I'm not going to get too deep into the types of foods. But you know, as a general rule, you want to eat much more vegetables, more lean meats, um, less fatty stuff, um, less carbs, those kinds of things. Um, also, alcohol. You know, alcohol is very inflammatory to our body and tends to be a little bit more so as we age, especially the beers. Um, so, if uh, by limiting those types of more inflammatory alcohols, that can also help quite a bit. Um, and then, you know, your environment, both internal and external. Um, the air you breathe is important. It's not a good idea to smoke if you want to slow the, the process of, of these bodily changes. But also, you know, making sure that you don't have a parasite from that trip to Mexico five years ago. Um, these are all little things that can really inflame our system and can cause that body fat. Um, but for the, you know, the, the physical adipose tissue or the fat, we're, we're obviously focusing on physical exercise. And the, from a neurological standpoint, the best way to activate your brain is with physical exercise. It's a full brain activation, but we gotta do it. And as we get older, it becomes more and more important that we're initiating some kind of physical exercise routine. So as we age, really our entire lives, we really should be trying to get at least four or five days of good physical exercise in at least 30 minutes, um, cardio activity, but also muscle, uh, also weight, weight lifting, those kinds of things. We need to stress the body. The body doesn't respond to repetitive activities. So doing the same exercise over and over for months and months and months is only gonna have so much of a benefit. It's important that we're actually stressing our body, pushing herself harder, doing new and novel types of activities because that's how the brain takes in information and then grows and changes and gets better. Um, so that's really important when we're trying to build muscle mass, you know, as we get older is making sure that we are changing up our exercise routine and making sure we actually are doing a regular exercise routine. Um, as far as hormonal changes, I'm going to let Dr. Nell dig, dig a little bit further and deeper into the hormones, but, you know, something like balding, balding is actually due to an 
increased testosterone marker response. So a lot of people with uh, that are losing hair, it's actually because their testosterone levels might actually be a little bit too high. Well, if your muscle mass is wasting away, that's a sign that your testosterone might be a little bit too low. So that's why it's not enough to just give you a bunch of testosterone or something and call it a day. We really need to look at this functionally, figure out where's the breakdown in your system so that we can regulate things as normally as possible to give you the right levels of things so that we can maybe increase the muscle mass and also reduce the likelihood that you're going to have any sort of hair loss. Um, Dr. No, what do you wanna to add to that? Um, the only thing I would add, and I love that you harped on the epigenetics uh, portion and also that you left hormones for me because I love it. Um, you know, there is a lot of talk around testosterone, but even when you look within and we can get super complicated in this, but that's why we run tests in our practice, right? Um, but let's say you're looking at a testosterone level. This could be not enough testosterone compared to estrogens where you're total testosterone might look okay, but there's an imbalance there or compared to LH, luteinizing hormone. So there's a balance of hormones in the body that yes, for women get talked about all the time. And there are tons of resources for that. But for some reason with men, we're often just hearing about testosterone and there's really a delicate balance in the male body when it comes to that. And a lot of things that can be done, the physical exercise portion is huge. And you can even play with the physical exercise to affect the hormonal component. Um, so I have a lot of patients who will be playing with different levels of intermittent fasting, timed fasting workouts in order to shift the hormonal component in the body. And this can get pretty individualized. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of a, a functional approach. It has to be functional for the patient sitting in front of you and fit into their lifestyle. Awesome. I think we're ready for the next slide, Nick. Okay, so we're gonna see a lot of overlap with this kind of stuff because at the end of the day, most of the symptoms that are, are typical of a man as they age, it comes down to hormonal regulation, nutrition, inflammation, and physical activity. Um, I mean, that, that's kind of the overarching concept that we really need everybody to take away from this um, on top of how we might go about this from a more nitty gritty standpoint to fine tune and tweak your, your physiology as best as we can. That's kind of why Dr. Nell and I exist. Um, so decreased sex drive, stamina. Um, uh, let's talk about this from a brain component. Um, when we're talking about the brain, sex drive, a lot of that is coming from our limbic lobes. Um, you know our subconscious, more primal parts of our brain. Um, but those parts respond to hormones. And um, obviously testosterone is a important part of this. Many men as we age start to decrease their testosterone. Um, we have beat it over the head how important it is to figure out you know, why testosterone is abnormal and what we can do to help it. But there are things that you can do just on a regular day-to-day -day basis that can help get those testosterone stores up help with that drive motivation just a little bit more. Um, so physical exercise is a really, really great way to do this. When we exercise physically, we are forcing our body to produce a little bit more testosterone, a little bit more cortisol, which is what helps us get a little bit more of that energy motivation and can then lead to libido and increased sex drive. Um, sleep is also incredibly important. We're gonna talk a little bit about sleep. It's got its own slide in a little bit. But sleep is when we recover. You know, we, we need to make sure that we're getting proper sleep if our body is going to be able to heal, if our brain is going to be able to heal. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, and then of course, nutrition. The kinds of foods we eat can help reduce inflammation, which can help our hormonal balance, or some of the foods we eat can actually mimic types of hormones and can, and can help in, in those ways, you know, things like maca powders and stuff like that. Now, I'm usually not a fan of just going for that. I, I, I like to have somebody talk to a practitioner before they get on some of those really hardcore herbs and supplements because um, they can be really intense. And, you know, if it's not the right thing for you, it can really mess you up and we, we don't want that to happen. So, you know, you, you see all of these different kinds of herbs and powders and supplements that you can take to help increase testosterone and, and all that. Um, I usually shy away from those, at least before you speak to a practitioner, because there's a little bit more going on than, than the, the products will have you believe. Um, and then, you know, we talked a little bit from a neurological standpoint, 
the brain controls everything. So if your brain is not functioning appropriately, um, your hormones might not be functioning appropriately, your body might not be functioning appropriately. So this is what can lead, you know, help with things like erectile dysfunction, those kinds of things. Um, th there's more than just a hormonal aspect to it. We need to also make sure that the brain is able to communicate effectively with the rest of our body. Um, and that's where a lot of the neurological rehabilitation comes in um, and some of the other types of, uh, you know, treatments that we do in the office. Dr. Nell? Yeah. Um, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, the identification of the root cause can be really tricky. And anytime you mess with the endocrine system, like Dr. Dan was talking about with throwing supplements into a problem, you know, it can sound like a great idea because you're like, oh, it's a supplement. It's more natural. It's, you know, not a pharmaceutical. It's working with my body. Um, or now you're even seeing, you know, advertised ED drugs, you know, direct to consumer, which as a practitioner is terrifying to me because not only is it not addressing the underlying issue, but that everything is so connected as you're seeing just in these first few slides. So that could throw something else off if we're not treating the root cause of an issue. Um, I, for example, I have a, a supplement that a lot, I give to a lot of my athletes and it's a vasodilator. And so it helps very much with athletic performance and recovery, but then men also come back and they say, Hey, you know, that, uh, helped with some other stuff too. Um, I actually feel a lot better in the bedroom. So that's a great side effect, but it still is something we need to have a continued conversation about because if we didn't even know that was a problem, you know, that's hard to figure out when you're just ordering something online and diving right into that. So the importance of speaking to a practitioner about your symptoms and how they're all connected before disrupting the endocrine system is really important. Yeah, that's so good. And, you know, I tell my people um, when we're doing any kind of hormonal regulation, the, this is not hormone replacement, okay? We are not trying to override your hormone system because that's not what gets your endocrine system working better by overriding it. What we wanna do is we wanna baby your system back into proper function. We wanna give the body the correct tools that it needs to make the right amounts of things at the right time. And over time with a low and slow process, we tend to get a little bit more of a longer lasting result rather than just doping you up with a ton of testosterone to you know, override what um, a system that's, that's struggling. So if we can try to really get underneath and see what does your body need to help regulate this appropriately so your body can maybe make the right amount of testosterone, that's a much better long-term result for the patients rather than them having to rely on this supplement that makes them feel great for a short period of time, but is really actually making them worse over time as they just continue to increase their doses on these kinds of supplements. So um, really, really awesome, awesome information, Dr. Nell. Okay, uh, let's hit the next slide. Okay, decreased focus energy. This is very similar to the sex drive. Um, now, focus and energy, and we're talking from a neurological standpoint, um, a lot of our focus comes from the frontal lobes, more particularly the orbital frontal lobes. Um, the best way that we can activate our frontal lobes is physical exercise. So doing um, a normal physical exercise at routine, as we had discussed, is incredibly important. Now. As far as a hormonal standpoint goes, and Dr. Nell again will probably go further into this, um, your energy hormone is called cortisol. And cortisol is actually released when you exercise because when we exercise, we're using up a lot of energy. So cortisol is released, which breaks down more sugar and then gives us more energy. So finding ways to regulate our cortisol levels is very, very important for increased energy. Now. I see a lot of head injury and migraine patients, and most of my patients have been so stressed out for so long um, that their cortisol levels are basically non-existent because their brains and adrenal glands are tired, they're fatigued, they can't keep up with it. Um, so that's when we have to really focus on babying this system back into health to try to get those energy levels up. So we're, we're oftentimes working on this kind of what we call cortisol rhythm that, that we may talk a little bit more about in a bit. 
um, to try to just up that energy a little bit. Um, obviously nutrition comes into this huge, you need to give your body the building blocks that it needs to make all the right sorts of chemicals and stuff if it's gonna be able to do its job. So this is why it's so important that you're getting nutrition in your diet. You need to make sure that the foods you're eating actually have the things that your body needs to run their normal processes. And you can get all of this from a proper diet. It's hard to do, especially in this day and age, but it is possible. And if you are having trouble with these kinds of things, there are good daily supplements that you can take. But again, you're kind of missing the point if you're relying on those kinds of things. So I, I do have a few products that I recommend for a good daily supplement that will give your body all the tools that it needs. And you know, it's researched and I know it works and all that kind of stuff. But the more and more we can focus on really putting good foods in our body and setting those habits so that we're not fighting an uphill stream, uh, an uphill battle, that, that, that was much better for us long term, um, which leads us to you know, inflammation. If you eat junk, you're going to be inflamed. If you're smoking, you're going to be inflamed. If you're not exercising, you're going to be inflamed. If you're, not, if you're sitting all day, you're going to be inflamed. If you have a parasite, you're going to be inflamed. We need to make sure that we're taking steps to reduce that. Reducing inflammation is, is kind of a it seems like a simple concept, but there are so many things that can bring on inflammation that it actually takes quite a bit of sleuthing to get down to it and figure out what might need to be done to take care of that. Um, as we had talked about neurological health, you know, making sure your brain isn't inflamed, your brain is functioning appropriately, that's also incredibly important. And then gut health. Um, we, we talked about that a, a little bit, making sure that there is no sort of parasite um, making sure that you don't have what's called intestinal permeability, where the gut lining is breaking down. All these things are incredibly fatiguing to our body and really affect our, our focus and our energy as we try to get through our days. Dr. Now. Yeah, um, one of my favorite examples from one of my functional medicine instructors talking about inflammation and the reality of it is, you know, it doesn't have to be this huge obvious reaction that your body's having to have a really damaging effect. Mm -hmm. So he always does this scratch analogy. So, you know, if you very lightly scratched your hand over and over, eventually you would get to the point where that skin is broken, you're bleeding, even though it's gentle, 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 it's about the repetition of that. So that's particularly important to keep in mind when we're talking about gut health, when we're talking about nutrition, you know, every bite that you take is either fighting disease or fueling disease. And if you think about, you know, you pop a medication and you do that one dosage a day, how many doses of nutrition are you having? So many. So there's such an opportunity there with your gut health, with nutrition to affect any of these things that we're talking about. And those different causes of inflammation I mean, that can be your environment, it can be toxins, it can be stressors, like your day-to-day -day stress that you're just not getting out of. It can be hormone irregularities. Um, so those are all things that we have to figure out, okay, what's the root cause of that? And with this decreased focus and energy, decreasing the inflammation for what I've seen in my practice, the fastest out of all of these symptoms, this is what responds the quickest if you find the right inflammation trigger. People notice when their brains start working better, particularly if they're leading this like high performance lifestyle and working a lot. So before you, know, you lose the 25 pounds that you wanna lose, you're gonna start noticing that your brain is working better and realize maybe how poorly it was working before. The switch is kind of incredible. It's, it's, it's like, a, it's, it literally is like a switch flips a lot of the time where you know, you've been in a certain state for so long and then you start to address this and you just open your eyes one morning and you know, you feel clearer than you felt in 20 years. Um, it's it's in incredible um, what the body can do, you know, when, when you actually start to address these things and it, it can happen fairly quickly. You, it, you don't have to radically change your life. You know, you, you, can, you can start slow with certain sorts of things. It begins with just identifying, you know, identifying what are the things that are probably contributing to this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, a, a quick chat with, with somebody who knows what they're doing with this um, really can go a long way to bring some clarity. And um, just that, that understanding, that clarity, kind of knowing a little bit more about what's going on for you, with you, um, tends to really, really help with patient outcomes, at, le at least from me, what I've seen clinically. Um, you know, ju just sitting a patient down and, and, and really explaining to them that 
this is what's going on with you. These are the potential reasons why it's going on with you. We're really going to try to check it off the list, hit each point to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure your body is functioning appropriately. Um, you know, it's unfortunately a new, a newer form of of healthcare, um, but we are really driven, Dr. Nell and I, to make this approach to healthcare really the, the gold standard because we really do believe that this is what brings true function and health to, to the people of the world. All right, Nick, let's hit the next one. Okay, poor sleep recovery. Um, sleep, I, I'm gonna go a bit into sleep. We obviously need to sleep because sleep is what allows us to recover. Um, uh, we need to recover our body and our brains. So I'm gonna break this down for you. We really wanna get about eight hours of sleep every single night, at least eight to 10 hours. Now the prime sleeping times are usually sometime around 10 p.m. to about 6 a.m. Those are kind of the prime hours. You can shift up and down a couple hours. You can tack on an hour or two um, you know, on either end of it. But the purpose of sleep is to give your body some time to regenerate. So the rule of thumb is that you know the first half of the night usually from like that 10 to 2 a.m time is typically when your body does most of its healing so all of your cells are starting to clean out waste everything's starting to kind of heal up the second portion of the night from about 2 a.m to 6 a.m is when your brain does most most of its healing um so when we are in those late hours of the night that's when all the plasticity in our brain is built so when i'm doing neurological rehab I really need people to get that late night sleep because it allows the all the work that we did the day before to start to really set into their brain. So um, re really important there. And the brain actually changes size and shape when you sleep to help push out waste products. And what we're finding is that people with insomnia, so people who have trouble sleeping, are showing you know, four or five times more likelihood of ending up with a neurodegenerative disease just because their brain isn't giving the time to flush waste product out appropriately. So, um, so, so critical that we're sleeping. And you know, this is why, at, you know, have you ever noticed that when you feel like you're kind of getting sick, you start to feel much worse around that like 7 p.m., 8 p.m. time? This is usually because that's when the immune system is starting to kick in. You're starting to get to that body recovery state. So that's why you start to feel kind of really crummy and run down around that 7, 8 p.m. time because that's when the body is really starting to do that. Um, now, as far as waking up and going to sleep, um, that is entirely regulated by what's called our cortisol rhythm. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Nell to go deeper into that. I can tag team on it if she needs me on that. Um, but also obviously nutrition, we need to make sure we're eating properly. Um, but I, I did wanna to touch a little bit on the neuromusculoskeletal health aspect of this. Let's talk from a musculoskeletal aspect. What might keep you from sleeping? Uh, well, you know, one of the most common things is pain. You know, I have neck pain or I have back pain or, you know, I, I'm, I'm hurting when I sleep. So I'm tossing and turning all night. So obviously it begins with addressing any of the issues that are keeping you from getting to sleep. So addressing your pain, um, be that, you know, more natural methods with Dr. Nell acupuncture, me with chiropractic work, neurological rehab, cold laser, electrical stim. There's a billion things that you can do um, from a musculoskeletal standpoint to help with pain. Um, one size doesn't fit all with that. Everybody responds a little bit differently. You have to kind of fish around and see what works best for you. Um, uh, but uh, then obviously there's, you know, the, the, more, the more invasive um, ways to go about it, like the more medication, surgery, the injections, those kind of routes. Um, and, you know, I, I'm always a fan of trying to be as non-invasive as possible. That's why I do what I do, because I want to be non-invasive. But, you know, sometimes there is a, a need to do something a little bit more invasive. And, and if that's what needs to be done to allow you to have little enough pain to get a night of sleep, sometimes it might be worth it. Um, and I would definitely talk to a, a functional practitioner about that, because if I'm recommending that you get an injection or surgery, you probably really need it. Um, uh, so that, that's why I, I, if, if you ever have questions about some of the more invasive, you know, medical procedures, talk to somebody but, like Dr. Nell, um, because we are, are, we always have in our mind, what is the least amount that I can do to get you the biggest result? Um, but also from more of a neurological standpoint, I want to talk a little bit about a nerve called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is our body's rest and digest nerve. It's the nerve that's responsible for 
calming us down, cooling us out, and allowing our digestion to function appropriately and really allow us to just kind of recover and heal a little bit. Um, the vagus nerve works opposite of our what's called sympathetic or, or stress centers when we're in kind of fight or flight mode. And in the current day with a worldwide pandemic going on with a lot of people out of work, just in general, you know, the stresses that come on with everyday life, we tend to be a little bit more on edge, a little bit more in that fight or flight mode. So anything we can do to shift us away from that and more towards a calming recovery state, um, the, the better. And the nerve that's exclusively, you know, um, required to do that is the vagus nerve. Now, there are many, 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 many ways that you can go about um, activating your vagus nerve. In my office, we use electrical stimulation. I literally zap it with electricity to get it to go. But, you know, something as simple as humming, meditation, gargling, these kinds of things can help a lot with that. Abdominal massage can help a lot with that. Um, there are a, a long list of things you can search online, natural ways to, you know, activate your vagus nerve, but just by getting that nerve a little bit more functional, it can help with recovery because they work on a seesaw. So if you're in fight or flight mode, your vagus nerve function is going to be very low. But if we shift that vagus nerve function up, the sympathetics or that fight or flight mode has to come down. They can't both be high at the same time. So whatever we can do to activate that nerve, get your get that functioning better, it will help just cool you down, help with recovery, help with sleep, all those kinds of things. Dr. Nell, I'll let you finish it up. I think this is our favorite topic. Doug, yeah. Because I could go on about this all day, but since you addressed vagus nerve, the one thing I want to say about the seesaw, this is the same when you're looking at, you know, peak performance, you need that recovery. So if you're looking to increase your performance in your day-to-day -day life, your brain health, your focus, your athletic performance, your sex drive, you have to be able to recover optimally as well. So the more that you're doing on that recovery side, the better you're going to do on the performance side. Um, and working with vagus nerve is you know, an amazing way to do that. There's tons of ways that you can do that on your own. I also use Eastim uh, with needles and it might be a little less scary. Uh, it feels really relaxing actually, but you do have the ability to manually stimulate that nerve and bring you out of sympathetic, which is incredible, the recovery techniques that we have at our disposal at this point. Um, and with cortisol rhythm, so uh, like Dr. Dan said, you know, this is a really important um, hormone for, you know, a natural stress response, for natural energy, for being able to function in day-to-day -day life, but we want it regulated in such a way that it's helping you rather than harming you. And when we are constantly stressed, this can get a little out of whack. You know, you want to have more cortisol in the morning when you need your energy and it needs to come down in the evening. And what happens, happens is a lot of times this gets reversed, unfortunately. So people who are having difficulty sleeping, people who are, you know, night owls and like to do all of their work at that time, night workers, people who, you know, have kids and are used to staying up late. There's a lot of things we do in our lifestyle that can flip that. And there's a lot of natural things you can do to bring that back into balance. One really easy thing that I have patients do is literally as soon as they pop out of bed in the morning, they're doing three minutes straight of crazy hit training, which sounds awful. Um, but as soon as you roll out of bed, do some jumping jacks, do some push-ups, do some sit-ups that will spike your cortisol in the morning and give your body a natural boost. And yes, there's plenty you can do with nutrition, supplementation, um, but everybody's why that this is happening is a little bit different. So that's why I think we're beating a dead horse at this point. It's important to talk to a practitioner who can help you identify the root cause of why this is going on. Couldn't have said it better. All right. So just to recap, before we go to um, the Q&A and how this plays out, andropause is just a physiological shift with really common symptoms. Some we can predict, uh, some we can help with the underlying issues that cause that. It's a very real thing that men experience and should be talked about. Uh, many of these symptoms reduced, reversed. And as you've seen, all of this overlap, many of these symptoms are connected with other symptoms. And you have the power to make those meaningful changes in your life and age optimally. And 
you know, unfortunately in standard of care, sometimes we don't look at the whole picture, um, but we're looking to change that and make sure that everyone has a sustainable plan that fits within their own lifestyle. Like Dr. Dan was saying earlier, you know, we can give you 50 things to do, but even starting with one or two is going to make a meaningful impact on your symptoms and your life. Nick, next slide. So we'd have to talk about solutions, which I feel like we've certainly peppered in um, here and there, but wanted to make sure that we also gave you a little of an idea of what this process looks like from a functional or integrative perspective, just so you know where to even start. Um, so Dr. Dan, do you wanna go into how you sure. would do it? So I'll just go into you know my typical approach when I'm when I'm I'm dealing with a patient. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of overlap between the way that Dr. Nell and I handle these things. Um, for me, it, it begins with a thorough history, and I think that that the art of the his of history has you know fallen by the wayside in, in, in the medical field a lot. You can glean so much of a person's condition just by having a conversation with them. Um, you know, within 10 minutes of, of talking with you, I can learn so much about, about what's going on, um, all the possibilities, and that helps to then pinpoint my examination so that I'm not just throwing a million exams at the wall, spending three hours with you, and it's a waste of time. Um, so just understanding a little bit more about what you have going on really helps direct us into where the issue might be. Um, then we move into more of an assessment, you know. Um, now, uh, our functional assessment is a little bit more involved than a, a traditional one. You know, it typically takes about 20, 30, sometimes 40 minutes for us to get through it. Um, but that's because for a lot of the conditions that we deal with, it's not a black and white situation. It's not like I can just look at this issue on a lab and, you know, give you a supplement. It's not like I can, or a medication. It's not like I can look at this on an MRI and see, you know, there's where the problem is. We got to work on it. Um, I wish that it was that simple, but it's just not. So what we need to do is we need to rely on a very targeted physical exam to try to figure out the problem. So we do uh, about 30-ish different tests that pull apart all the functions of your brain to see what works and what doesn't work. So looking at things like eye movements, looking at things like your gait patterns, that balance, coordination, reaction time, all of these things give us a little bit of a clue as to what part of the brain might be doing its job well enough or not as well. And then from there, we can take all the things that, that are abnormal, either very abnormal or slightly abnormal, and we can start to look for the patterns. We can start to see, you know, okay, um, this finding was abnormal. It can mean seven different things, um, but it lines up with this finding over here. Let's see, is there one or two areas of the brain where all of this dysfunction might be boiling down into? And then from there, we target that part of the brain with um, various stimulative exercises, be it electrical stimulation, laser, eye motion rehabilitation, physical exercise, musculoskeletal treatments. You know, there are countless ways to actually go about treating this kind of stuff. Um, the hard part is really figuring out what's going on, and that's where the assessment really, really comes into play. On top of that, you know, if we need to get any imaging, we'll order out for that. If we need to do any testing, we'll order out for that. Um, we tend to use some of the more high-end, newer tests that are showing to be much more promising and give us much better results than the more typical gold standard medical tests. And, you know, I'm really hoping in the next decade or so, a lot of these tests we're using become that gold standard um, because they're just that much better. Um, but the insurance industry is just a little bit behind on that. So, um, so that, that's my general approach. See what's going on with your body and your brain. Um, do we need to do any sort of testing to look at your hormones or your nutrition or anything like that? And then from there, it's just about targeting a specific program for you that is aimed to get your brain working as best as possible. That's it. Dr. Dan, you're right. There's so much overlap, so I can make it even quicker than that. Um, you know, it's again about identifying root cause for that individual and then creating a customized plan that fits in your lifestyle. 
Um, some of my treatment plans will include acupuncture. Some people are not physically available for acupuncture. I mean, shoot, it's during COVID. I'm not gonna tell you, oh, I have no means to help you. Yes, acupuncture is amazing and modulating the nervous system, the endocrine system, uh, really helping your brain function. But if you can't physically come into the office, we're still gonna find something that works, whether it's exercise, supplementation, um, so the thorough history is the biggest thing for us as well. Um, and you do a ton of paperwork before you even come in, you get to answer some really cool questionnaires that help put us towards a pattern um, and really see how do we get you the biggest bang for your buck. So that initial conversation details so much. And I do a lot of specialized testing, but like Dr. Dan said, you know, these are considered like cutting edge or, or newer. And unfortunately, like we're just waiting for standard of care to catch up to that, um, particularly when it comes to insurance. So to not overload a patient with a million different tests that yes, we could learn something from. Um, a lot of times what comes out of that initial con uh, conversation is some very targeted uh, blood work or specialized testing. And then when we see those results, if I need to tag anything onto that, because it's leading us towards a certain direction that we need to look more into. And then your treatment plan is going to be 100% your treatment plan and follow up um, accordingly. So yeah, that's like, it's really just different for everyone, but the basis of it is we're looking for the root cause of what's going on and helping you work something into your unique lifestyle so you can get results regardless of how you're living in this moment. Let's awesome. go to Kate. I love it. I love it. Okay, next slide. I think yeah. we are about ready to go into questions. Um, uh, we got some contact info at the bottom for myself and Dr. Nell. Um, uh, Throw it at us, Deb. Do we have anything good? Well, um, some of the questions may have already been answered, but I'll read those. Um, one I'm interested in hearing. Um, inflammation is a big topic today. Do you have any suggestions on foods to avoid that cause inflammation? Sure. Um, most people are not going to like the answer to this. I know. Um, <laughs> but the answer is like most things that people really enjoy. <laughs> Um, uh, so it, what's been shown to be the most inflammatory to the human diet are grains, so carbohydrates, simple carbs, um, and uh, dairies, um, those kinds of things as well. Um, we're, we're really not designed to ingest a lot of that kind of stuff, at least not from other animal sources. Um, so any kind of grain, not just glutinous grains, like we're also talking about rices and corns, you know, those kinds of things also are somewhat inflammatory. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I usually have the mindset of, you know, we're only on this earth for so long. Um, we deserve to enjoy things. And people are differently sensitive to these kinds of things. So, you know, yes, every human is sensitive to these kinds of things, but some people are fairly sensitive to them and they can maybe handle a little bit more of it than the average person. It's very rare that I'm telling somebody, you cannot eat this for the rest of your life. Um, because, you know, we're, we deserve to enjoy things every once in a while. And as long as you are, in, you are empowered to, you know, what might happen to you if you take that in, and as long as you're not making it the rule, it's the exception, um, I'm typically okay with it. But um, dairies, wheats, alcohol is also inflammatory for the most part. Um, you know, there's some evidence for red wines having a little bit of the opposite effect, but I'd argue you can get similar stuff from supplementation or, or like grape juice. Um, uh, but, uh, th those are the big ones for me are the, 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 um, the dairy, the grains and the alcohol. Do you have anything else, Dr. No? Yeah. It, I mean, it's the same. It's not fun to tell anyone. Um, and it, but it is true. Different people are affected differently. For me, dairy is a huge issue. If I have like a little bit of milk, I have a scar that will literally flare up. So it's, you know, it really depends on the individual. Some people it's like, oh, no, I'm having a little brain fog. It's gone the next day. Um, and also there are ways that you can play with all of that. Like you said, exception rather than the rule or certain alcohols being less inflaming than others. I'm personally a big tequila fan. I would never drink beer, um, but it's really like, how does your individual body react to that? And 
again, the most important thing is as long as you're informed and empowered about what the consequences of that may be, like we're all adults, there's still freedom of choice and, you know, the ability to balance things in life. And usually the way that I approach this for people who are really curious about seeing what foods they're sensitive to, you know, you could run a $10,000 food sensitivity panel if you really wanted to. Um, but usually what I end up saying is, you know, go super clean for two months where you're cutting out everything that could be inflammatory to you. And then after you're, you know, clean for a couple months, food by food, add them back in for a day. So, you know, if you go two months off, but you really love cheese, you know, for one day, eat a ton of cheese and see how you do. If you're bloated, if you have gas, if you have diarrhea, if you're sluggish, if, you know, anything feels abnormal, you're probably sensitive to that and you know it's probably not a good food for you to have. So that's kind of the easy, easy and cost-effective way to kind of figure out what, what affects you is what, what we call an elimination type style diet. Actually, you learn and a lot from. <laughs> you learn a lot from it. Yes, you can learn a lot. Um, I've noticed my uncle seems off balance lately in his physical walking and moving about. What should I suggest to him? As I don't think he's aware that he's off balance or not necessarily walking as uh, normally would. Sure. Um, it, it's really tough. It's really tough to get somebody to understand that something is going going wrong in those situations. Um, the most eye-opening thing to me clinically has been one, the history actually having, like talking to a doctor about it sometimes kind of uncovers the fact that there's an issue, but then it comes down to the examination. You know, we, we have objective measures that we can use to quantify a person's balance, to give them a fall risk score. And if people do this test and it shows us on paper that 99% of men your age are doing better than you on this test, that's a very easy and clear way to show somebody that balance is an issue and is probably something you need to work on. So um, for me, I think the best way to get people to understand is by running them through objective tests that, can, that you can't fake that will show you that there is or is not a problem. Okay. And neurological health is the concern of many men who have seen their parents or their grandparents experience memory loss or they have a diagnosis of a neuro neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's. Are there tests available, genetic tests, or what's available to help put men's mind at ease that they may, you know, have this in their family? Is this something that's going to happen to me? So, so I love, I mean, I think we both are going to take this, but I'm going to let Na Dr. Nell to start with it. Cause that is just such a, such a complex topic. Yeah, I know. So I'm like, okay, how to keep this in a minute. So on a personal note, I have Alzheimer's in my family. It's like all the women, like they all get it. Um, so far to the fact where like, they just like resign themselves to the fact that like that's going to happen. Um, a test that I run with patients who and I've run on myself, patients who have um, Alzheimer's dementia in their history, there is an incredible panel by Cyrex Labs um, that is relatively new, like within the last year. And it identifies uh, lifestyle factors that could be contributing to neurodegenerative diseases. So some people having an issue with egg whites, um, having an issue with certain toxins, certain chronic infections, parasites, this screens for pretty much anything that's been researched that could be in your system um, that's shown to have a correlation with things like Alzheimer's and dementia and lets you know if your body is having an inflammatory response to that so that you can work on eliminating that for a period of time. Um, dairy came up super high for me, shocking. Um, and it will be different for everyone. I ran it on my aunt who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 55. And what was crazy is for her, it what she actually didn't have any of the proteins that the doctors were telling her like, oh, you must have amyloid beta. No, none of that. Um, she was having an issue with egg whites and um, exposure to aluminum. 
and she cut those things out and she's already seeing dramatic improvement within a few months. So that's something highly specific that I run for people with this risk. And we could get so much more specific than that, but I'm gonna could let you Dr. tell us the name of that test. Is it a blood? Yeah, and you would need to see a practitioner who's like qualified to run it and read the results, but I'm happy to put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So that that was awesome for me. Um, uh, so we talked about sleep and the importance of getting that late night sleep because that allows your brain to change shape, flush waste products out, and that alone can help reduce the likelihood of neurodegenerative conditions. Um, when it comes to Alzheimer's, in the functional community, more and more Alzheimer's is being looked at as, as type three diabetes mm -hmm. um, because we're finding that in pretty much all cases of Alzheimer's, there is some kind of sugar management issue, um, some kind of metabolic syndrome. So just by also cleaning up that diet, keeping it anti-inflammatory, you seriously reduce the likelihood that you're gonna end up with these conditions. This goes back to that epigenetics that we were talking about. Just because it's in your genes, if you do everything you can to lessen the, the load on your brain, you're going to at the very least, slow the progression of those kinds of conditions. Now, from a neurological standpoint, from an assessment standpoint, there are you know, some objective tests that we can do to look at the potential of you know, an early onset of these kinds of things. Um, I don't try to be a, a forefront expert in, the, in these conditions because they're, they're so complex and just ex extraordinarily heartbreaking conditions to have to deal with, um, but sleep and nutrition is extremely important. Now I do treat early stage Alzheimer's and early stage Parkinson's. When you dig into the neurology of it, I mean, basically it's frontal lobe dementia. You know, the, the frontal lobes are starting to waste away. So from a neurological rehabilitation standpoint, we want to activate those frontal lobes as much as possible. So, you know, there is a lot of research to show that things like physical exercise, high intensity interval training, kickboxing, these kinds of things that require a little bit of impact on your body, but also require hand-eye coordination and a little bit of focus can really help strengthen the brain as much as possible. Um, and there's some evidence to show that um, rapid eye movement therapy can help a little bit with this. So just something as simple as, you know, looking back and forth between your fingers as quickly as possible is a good frontal lobe activation. That might help a little bit with that as, as well. Um, but the big thing for me with these neurodegenerative conditions is you got to catch it as early as possible. Because once you get beyond a certain point, it's very, very hard, if possible at all, for us to make any progress. But I have seen early stage Parkinson's within a few weeks of care, their tremors reduce. You know, they're, they're much more functional, able to get throughout their day, remembering things a little bit better for the Alzheimer's patients. So in the early stage, there really are things we can do to reverse some of these symptoms and maybe even, you know, extend the period before things start to get, get worse. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, neurodegenerative conditions are just some of the, the most terrible, terrible things that anybody can deal with. Um, and I, I am hopeful that over the next, you know, few decades, we create more treatments for these kinds of things. Because for me, clinically, once we get past, you know, stage three or so, um, it's, it's really, really challenging for me to make much of a change with those kinds of things. Okay. And also, just to really quickly add on to that, looking for things that mimic neurodegeneration are really important. And we talked about some of that with like the focus and the brain health in general. Um, but something we didn't mention in sleep that's incredibly important to talk about is sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. um, and there are patients who have severe sleep apnea who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. And that could be totally reversible if their sleep apnea was addressed. So, um, a really great book that I love is The End of Alzheimer's. I'll put that in the chat as well. All about like the lifestyle components when it comes to neurodegeneration. But like Dr. Dan said, it's it's much more impactful the earlier you can look at these things. Okay, one last question that came in. Besides elimination, what are good ways to fight inflammation? You want supplements, Nick? I see it was you. <laughs> like you don't want to cut out, but you don't want to do damage. 
<laughs> so if somebody else liked tequila as well, then <laughs> right. what um, would be your... So as far as anti-inflammatories go, um, turmeric has been shown to be helpful with that. Um, resveratrol is helpful with that. Omega-3s are helpful with that. Um, we need B vitamins are very important with that. D vitamins, very important with that. Um, but again, it's not as simple as just going to Costco and buying the big discount thing of supplements and, you know, popping them. Um, it just doesn't really work like that. So that's why we like to encourage people to get these sorts of nutrition from actual food um, because it is actually going to be absorbed into your body <laughs> and it's going to actually be usable. Now, I do have some brands and products that I do like to work with. I'm not here to promote them or anything like that. So you can um, email me or something later on. I'll, I'm happy to give you some of the brands that I like to, to recommend for these kinds of things. But uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, taking care of yourself is the best way to get your inflammation down. Yeah. Same supplement recommendations, but I'm also very big on quality um, because it's not, I mean, it makes a huge difference if you're having a quality product with anything. You never want to put something in to help your health that, you know, has a byproduct or a toxin in it, um, as unfortunately, you know, a lot of products do. So definitely feel free to reach out to us, use this as a resource, and we can. And not only that, a lot of the supplements you're receiving over the counter are just like, they don't do what they say they're going to do. <laughs> you know, they're just, just because it's got, you know, 8,000% of your vitamin C for the day does not mean you're absorbing 8,000% of your vitamin C. It's got 8,000% of the vitamin C because they're hoping that you can absorb maybe one or 2% of that, you know? Um, so good supplements have cofactors that allow, you know, the supplements to actually be absorbed and used by your body. So that's why, you know, you kind of get what you pay for um, with supplements a lot of the time. But more than that, you, you really got to dig into the brands. Um, you want brands that are, you know, nutraceutical great, you know, they're manufactured like they're pharmaceuticals, they're researched like they're pharmaceuticals, they, you know, that what they say is in it is in it. Um, and you know, that just requires research. Now, Dr. Nell and I have done that research for you. So that's why we like to say, just talk to us first before you go buying a ton of stuff, um, because we can make that journey much more bearable for you. Yeah. Okay. And that's the tequila no thing, just no sugar. <laughs> just the tequila, not the mixer. <laughs> Okay, we have lots of great, we've run over a little bit, but what amazing information. We have great comments. This was excellent. Thank you so much. Really some big aha moments for me, for myself and my parents. This is from Michael. I really appreciate you guys sharing all this. Uh, Todd, before he left, commented this was great information. Uh, ben David, this was great. Thank you all. I know everyone learned something. This was just an amazing presentation. We really appreciate your efforts and all your wonderful uh, educational information. We were all educated today and we appreciate it. If anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat and I'll try to get those via email to the doctors. But thank you very much and thank you for everyone attending. Awesome. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Dr. Nell. Thanks, Nick in the chamber. This is always fun. Yes. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank right, you so much. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.